it's important that we have a rigorous definition of continuity when we're talking about functions. And so here's what we do. For a function to be continuous at a point, we have three conditions that must be met. First of all, we actually have to have a point, so f of c has to exist. And secondly, the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. And finally, the limit has to equal the y value. If all three of those are met, then we have continuity at a point. So let's look at three examples here. So here I've got f of c is defined right there, and the limit is defined up there, but they aren't equal to each other. Therefore, this is not continuous. Okay, now here, f of c is defined right here, but the limit does not exist, so the second condition fails, so this is not continuous. Finally, here, f of c exists, the limit as x approaches c exists, and it is the same value. So therefore, this is continuous. So you have two types of discontinuities. You have removable and non-removable discontinuities. Here's an example of a removable one. And it's basically a hole right in the graph there. And you can tell if you have a removable discontinuity if you are able to factor and cancel. So this factors into x minus 3 times x plus 2 over x minus 3. And that obviously cancels the x minus 3's, and so we get x plus 2. So at x equal 3, we have a removable discontinuity at 5, because 3 plus 2 is 5. So you could fill that in by making a piecewise function and saying, um, you know, that at x equal 3, f of x has to equal 5. Okay. Uh, here we have a non-removable discontinuity, and it's a step function, greatest integer function. And there's no way that I could fill in the holes and make these gaps connect. So that's called a non-removable discontinuity. Now sometimes we are interested in just what's happening on one side of a limit. And so we have a little notation here. This reads the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the left. That's what that little negative sign means right there, from the left. And so we go to this piecewise function. And since we are only interested in what's happening to the left of 3, we are going to use the piece of the function that works with x values to the left of 3, namely the x plus 2 over 2. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 3 from the left will be the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of x plus 2 over 2, which ends up being 5 halves. It's also nice to have one-sided limits when you're dealing with restricted domains. For example, right here, we can only consider values to the right of negative 3, because if I put in, say, negative 4, I'd be taking the square root of a negative number, which we can't do. So that means that the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the right will be the square root of 9 minus negative 3 squared, which is 0. OK. So basically, a limit exists if and only if the limit of f of x equals l as x approaches c from the left, and the limit of f of x as x approaches c from the right equals l. In other words, the function has to approach the same y value from the left and the right for the limit to exist. So in this situation here, if I've got a function, and here's c. And let's say this is 5, and that's 3. So the limit of f of x as x approaches c from the left is 5. And the limit of f of x as x approaches c from the right is 3. Because they have different y values, the limit as x approaches c 
of f of x does not exist. Okay? But how about this situation? There's c and there's f of c and as I'm approaching from the left along here we're approaching f of c and as we're approaching from the right we're also approaching the same value of f of c therefore we can say this limit exists because from the left and the right we approach the same y value okay now here's an important theorem the intermediate value theorem and it says that if f is continuous, and that's important to consider, it has to be continuous for you to even apply this theorem. So if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, and f of a does not equal f of b, and k is any number between f of a and f of b, then there is at least, so there could be more, there's at least one number c in the interval a to b such that f of c equals k. So how do we apply this? Well, here's a function x squared plus x minus 1 and we're told that f of c is 11 so we need to verify the intermediate value theorem applies to the interval 0 to 5 and we're going to find the value of c guaranteed by the theorem. Well, is this continuous? Yes, it's a polynomial so it has to be continuous. Now let's check out what f of a is negative 1 and what f of b is so f of 5 is 25 plus 5 minus 1, which is 29. And notice that our k, 11, is between negative 1 and 29. So yes, the intermediate value theorem does apply. So let's go ahead and find the value of c. And it should end up being between 0 and 5. So 11 will equal c squared plus c minus 1, 0 will equal c squared plus c minus 12, which is equal to c plus 4 and c minus 3. So that means we have two choices for c, negative 4 or 3. Well, c has to be between 0 and 5, so that's our answer right there. c is going to be 3. And that's how you can use the intermediate value theorem. It's also useful if you know that f of a is some negative number less than 0 and f of b is a positive number. If that's the case, then you know that somewhere in there there has to be a value of c such that it equals 0 because the graph is doing something like this. It's starting out negative, it's ending up positive, and if it's continuous, it has to cross the x-axis somewhere between a and b. So it's helpful for locating zeros of a function.